Welcome to your commercial-free, uninterrupted investment show, sponsored by the SEC-registered investment firm, Wilsey Asset Management, a fiduciary firm owned and operated by President Brent Wilsey, who has been putting clients' investment needs first for over 40 years. The Smart Investing Show has been giving unbiased financial information for over 27 years on local radio stations right here in San Diego, providing you with fundamental analysis on stocks and investments you want to know about. Now... Here are your hosts, Brent and Chase Woolsey. Well, hello and welcome to the Smart Investing Show. I'm Brent Wilsey, president of Wilsey Asset Management. Great to have you here on the Smart Investing Show. We've got a lot of things to talk about, and we are still the proud investing partners of the San Diego Padres. And I do have to mention that I will be throwing out tomorrow is my big debut to be a pitcher for the Padres. I throw out the first pitch. I don't think it's going to happen as far as me being the pitcher. But it's like, I'm just saying, just got to get it to the catcher. That's what I got to do. I got to get it to him. But uh, I'm very honored to throw out the first pitch. I'll put it that way. And I got to say, too, it's so funny. You know, I, I came over to your house and you have this little like practice arena set up, I'll call it, just to see. I mean, 60 feet is longer than you, you think, especially. I don't think I've thrown a baseball. 66 feet, by the way. <laughs> I don't think I've thrown a baseball since high school. You know? Yeah. No, I just haven't. And you're like, wow, it's actually kind of harder than you think i have so much respect for those pitchers i was watching the game last night and it's like they're throwing 100 miles an hour in this little box and you're like it's it's (laughs) impressive (laughs) and i'm hoping to hit like 45 miles an hour (laughs) maybe that i don't even know (laughs) yet I just want to get it to him. That's what I want to do. So, but I'm very excited about it. So, and very honored. But um, we do have a lot to talk about here on the on the show today. We got uh, you know going to talk about the jobs report. I want to men- mention that. We're also going to talk about Apple stock, consumer spending. So we got some important topics to talk about here. And uh, Jace, we got uh, calls to take as well. Yeah, as always, that's what we're here for. You want to join the show? Phone number is eight three three two eight eight zero nine seven three. Again, that's eight three three. Two eight eight zero nine seven three. All right. Well, let's talk about the jobs report because uh, you know we've been saying for months uh, we are watching the jobs reports because it's such an important. We say that people will complain about inflation. They'll complain about things, but if they have their job, they are still going to spend, and that's what we're seeing. So the jobs report uh, did show non-farm payrolls increased by two hundred. And 53,000 in the month of April, which easily topped the estimate of 180,000. Now, on the negative side, the prior two months saw revisions to the downside that totaled 149,000 jobs. Gains continued to moderate in the report as the April gain was below the six month average of 290,000, but with an unemployment rate of 3.4%. I can't see payroll growth accelerating at this point. Areas that were on the top of the report included professional business services up 43,000, healthcare up 40,000, and once again, leisure and hospitality up 31,000 jobs. And I was kind of surprised in the leisure and hospitality sector because that, that was kind of slower growth. I mean, when you look at it, it, it has really slowed substantially considering the sixth month average has been an addition of 73,000 jobs per month. And the industry still does remain 2.4% or 402,000 jobs below pre-pandemic levels. And I, I bet you... We'll talk about that next, the job openings. I bet you there's plenty of job openings at restaurants and other hospitality areas <laughs> at this time. But no major industry saw a contraction in the port. One negative, though, was temporary help services declined by 23000 a month. And since its peak in March 2022, it is down 174000 One other area that continues to remain a concern was wage inflation. Average hourly earnings a month increased 4.4% over the last 12 months. This was an increase from last month's reading of 4.2%. But looking compared to last April's 5.8% gain, it was a nice deceleration. Overall, i got to say this report continues to feed our belief that the economy is in okay shape and also, too, inflation should continue to slow, not decline. Slow. Slow. <laughs> right. And, and and the numbers, you kind of break them down. I mean, you've got unemployment at 3.4%. Um, you, you're not going to have the leisure industry. is still doing very well. I saw a report from the Marriott CEO saying that uh, the, for the quarter, they were up like 25% over last year. They go, they're, they're we're stronger than ever. we got 6,000 job openings. Um, people are still traveling, which includes the leisure and hospitality side. So I'm wondering if they're starting to run out of people they can find that want to work in that industry. I mean, it, it just, you know, 3.4% unemployment, there's not a lot of people that 
maybe want to work any longer. Well, no, it, it's it's kind of funny. It, it, the economy is really interesting when you break it down. You have this kind of balancing act. It's really good that we have money in the economy right. and the liquidity. We talked about, again, that M2 money supply is still over $20 trillion. That's, again, money markets, checking accounts, savings accounts. There's mm-hmm. a lot of liquidity out there. But the downside is people are like, I don't want to work at Marriott. You know? <laughs> that doesn't sound like something I want. And until those savings start to kind of dwindle, I'm going to say, that's when people go, oh, crap, I do need a job. Right. So there's kind of this balancing act where it's good to have liquidity in the economy, but too much liquidity kind of presents people with the option of saying, I don't really need to work right now. And they're still getting paid well. I mean, my son, your brother Nash, uh, 20 years old, uh, works at OG's in Carnival Mountain Ranch. Um, The other night he came home, he goes, yeah, I got let go early, you know, slow night and so forth. And I go, well... You know, what did you make? And he goes, well, the the tips, I think he said he made $40 in tips. And I go, well, plus you get paid, what, $15 an hour? I said, so you you made about $70. You were there for two hours. That's still $35 an hour. I said, that's not bad. (laughs) You know, so um, people are getting paid pretty well. And and the thing, too, that has happened, the cost of a bill in the restaurant is much higher than it used to be. So, and now the norm is 20% tip. So, you know, usually I'll go out to dinner for $50, $60. Now, if you have drinks, it's going to be over 100 So the tip went from $15 or no, 20% would be $10 at 50 to now it's $100. So now it's $20. So the tips have doubled. So yeah. people doing better that way as well. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I wanted to say as well, too, I, I found it really interesting. They kind of pointed to the temporary help part. As I right. said, that was the only real industry that declined. And I kind of see that as a positive as well. I mean, because what that should mean is going forward, there shouldn't be as much fluctuation, I'll say, in, in yeah. layoffs and people that are unemployed, because if they have full-time positions rather than temp positions, that's a that's good for future indicator of, of potential layoffs and uh, also declines in the report. And the other thing I think about as well is you might say the only downside is maybe businesses' demand is slowing down because right. they don't need the temporary help. That's the only real downside I can see to it. But also on the other front is, again, that means people are finding more full-time jobs. And we'll talk about this next too with the job. There's a ton of job openings out yeah, there. Yeah. So maybe companies are saying, I'd rather just hire somebody full-time rather than using the temp help. I, I don't see that as a negative. I, I saw one uh, group kind of pointed to it when I was reading the report yesterday. It was a, it was a negative they pointed out. I was like, ah, no. Not a big negative. Right. And, and actually, I think a temp help, I, I do think of businesses and construction. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think, and I could be wrong on this, there's much temporary help in the leisure and hospitality industry because you generally hire somebody. You don't want somebody just for like a week or two. So yep. so it could be just on those areas there. So it, it, that, that's why we look at the, the numbers every month, kind of break them down. Uh, think about them in a logical way, saying, okay, what's really going on here? Saying, oh, my gosh, you know, the only, and it got only, what did I say, 100 and uh, 250,000 job increase. That's still <laughs> a very good number. And I did want to say, too, on the wage inflation front, as, as I said, it was 4.4%. And even on, like, the CPI, on, on PC, you're going to still see volatility in yeah. the inflation numbers. It's not going to be, and we've kind of seen this. I think people have gotten used to this. Where it's almost every single month you see the inflation decelerate. Right. And, you got to kind of look at the longer term trend here of again 5.8% last year to 4.4. That's a nice deceleration. You're still going to have bumps in the road where, you know, you have one month again maybe it's 4.4% this month, maybe it goes back to 4.1% and then maybe the following month it's 4.3%. It's not right. going to be a, a steady deceleration. You're going to always have bumps in the road with economic numbers. Right. Well, let's move on to the Jolts report, which uh well the headline job openings report, which is the Job openings and labor turnover survey, that's what JOLT stands for, uh, shows a slowdown. It is, again, important to compare to pre-COVID level, given the strange economy over the past few years. Job openings declined by 384,000 in the month of March to, understand this number, down to 9.6 million open jobs. And and when you look at it again, this is down 1.6 million when compared to the end of 2022, and is the lowest level since April 2021. And we pull out all these numbers because this is what the media talks about and how terrible things are. Yep. And oh my gosh, the labor market is terrible. Well, let's look at this. There are still 1.6 job openings <laughs> per available worker, and in February 2020, job openings stood at. Pausing for dramatic effect here. Drumroll. Seven million. <laughs> wow. 2.6 million more <laughs> job openings than before COVID started. So there's still plenty of them out there. And also, too, again, the negative side. Layoffs increased in the report by 248,000 to a level of 1.8 million. 
Again, while this may sound troubling, it is important to note that in February 2020, layoffs were 1.97 million. And, and and just to make sure people realize, because you bring up the, the date, February 2020, that was when everything was fine. Yep. That was before COVID hit. COVID actually came to, to late, we'll say. I mean, it was talked about in February, in February. but March is when everything kind of collapsed. Yep. And uh, it shows that, and, and again, if you look at 2019 up to February 2020, like everything was fine. No one concerned about anything. And job openings at $7 million. So we still have... Uh, what is that? Uh, gosh, I'm trying to my head real quick here. Probably about 30% more jobs open now than we did at a great time of February 2020. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. it, it's a, a big thing. And, you know, we, we had a meeting with a couple of potential clients yesterday, and I, I was talking about the layoff situation. And it's so funny, you go back to like 2019 or even early 2020 before we really started talking about COVID as a problem. And nobody was talking about layoffs. It didn't no. make the news. It wasn't a big deal. Right. <laughs> it's so funny. There was more layoffs then than there is now, but now that makes way more headlines. And it's like, I mean, we could still see layoffs increase, and it wouldn't be that big of a deal. We could go to 2 million layoffs, and, and that would still be within, like, a historical norm. Right. And and one thing you, you mentioned, that potential new clients that came in, and we, we, we do our presentation. We do bring out this part where we talk about the employment numbers. We talk about... Um, uh, money in the economy because people are concerned and we we address those issues because this is not a time to be concerned this is a time well I, I guess you should be concerned but this is a time that you could be a, should be in investing but you've got to understand what is going on in the economy and we show you the numbers uh, we do this for everybody that comes in as a potential client the presentation we do we show what's going on in the economy because if you're concerned on the economy you're not investing you're making a mistake uh, unless you're a short-term trader or something and, and good luck to you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll say that. So, but uh, let's move on because uh, we did have uh, Apple, uh, Apple stock to report. Uh, what was yesterday? Was it yesterday or Thursday? Uh, they reported Thursday. Thursday. Night. Thursday. Uh, so if you made money investing in Apple, we'll say congratulations. But I must say, though, I was not impressed with the most recent earnings from the company. The company saw sales decline. 2.5% compared to last year, and earnings per share was flat. Now, service revenue, which has been a nice growth catalyst for Apple in the past, saw sales grow just 5.4% compared to last year. And the other big thing I remember years ago is like, oh, Apple has too much reliance on the iPhone sales. Well, they still have a huge reliance mm -hmm. on iPhone sales, with that component of the business making up over 54% of total revenue in the quarter. Some may also point to the excitement over Apple's ninety billion dollar stock buyback plan and its four point three percent. That's a lot of money. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> and its four point three percent increase to the dividend. But unfortunately, due to Apple's size, the the market cap now is around two point seven five trillion dollars. Well, it's all relative. Again, a number means nothing at all unless you have something to compare it to. So when we actually look at that, the buyback plan would only amount to about 3.2% of the shares outstanding. I mean, that's a decent-sized buyback plan. Yep. But, I mean, I've seen other companies where they do like a 10% buyback plan, and the stock doesn't get any Ooh. credit yep. for it. So 3.2% is it's, it's decent. And that also doesn't incorporate the fact that if Apple stock goes up further, well, then you'll buy less shares outstanding because it's a hard dollar against now a, a bigger dollar. Good point, yeah. Let, let's say the, the, the buyback goes up to, or I'm sorry, the market cap goes to $3 trillion, three and a half. I mean, the higher that market cap goes, the less you're really buying back of the company. And also, this this is almost just, just laughable when I, I look at this. The dividend yield after the increase would be just 0.55%. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just not even making a dent, to be honest with you, with, with that dividend. And again, if the stock price were to go higher for Apple, that dividend yield would continue to get smaller, smaller. and smaller. And with Apple trading about 26 and a half times estimated 2024 earnings, the stock is just too expensive for lackluster growth. And, and, and again, Apple yesterday on the front page of Wall Street Journal, Apple misses estimates, you know, and it was a terrible headline. But yet Apple continues to go up. And when you look at the numbers, and again, it's a great company. I oh, have yeah. an Apple phone in my pocket. Um, but it it just does not justify what you say, 26 times Ford 26 earnings. 26 and a half. Half times Ford earnings. That's very expensive. And this is no longer a growth company. You're not getting a great dividend. I'm, I'm, I'd be surprised if they're even in dividend paying mutual funds because at 0.5%, that's not you know much of a dividend. 
And I don't see this stock going up. I, I, I believe this is like a Microsoft issue back when, when Microsoft for about 10 years languished back and forth with about 25% trading range for years. Because it's a great company, but I do believe it's going to take years for the earnings to catch up to the multiple. And you may see, I'm going to throw out numbers here, that the, the trading range may be from 140 to 180 for, for years to come because there's no catalyst to bring it above that. Um, and you're right. I mean, as far as I'm buying back stock, it's such a small amount. Um, you know, it, it, it just, I, I, it's, it's hard to say because everybody loves Apple. Um, and the other thing too that I, that I was thinking when I was reading in the Wall Street Journal that, oh, well, we've seen this going to expand in India. They're expanding over here. I don't know what the numbers are because they don't release them. But I know here in the U.S., you know, uh, AT&T, uh, Verizon, they pay for that phone. Yeah. And I think the phone's about $1,400. I doubt very seriously <laughs> that in India and China, those people are paying $1,400 for the phone. I believe that they're paying less because it's just a, they can't afford $1,400. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point because I was thinking about, okay, where can growth come from for Apple? I mean, they're already so large that the growth has to come from somewhere. The only logical argument I've heard in terms of growth would really be, I mean, they've ventured in different services and stuff, but I, I just think it's so hard to move the needle because you now, again, are worth $2.75 trillion. Like, right. you have so much money that it's harder to grow on top of that. And, uh, again, India, yeah. I mean, I know there's a rising economy there. There's obviously a huge potential population. But you're right, is people love Apple's margins. Are they going to have to sacrifice margin for growth? Then if they sacrifice margin, then you have to say, well, is it really worth trading at 26 and a half times earnings? Because one reason they get, I'm going to say, a, a premium multiple is because people are like, that margin is just so good. Right. Well, if the margin declines, and also, too, let's say income doesn't grow or there's other things that, that sales and earnings don't grow still, I mean, you could have some serious issues with the stock. You know, we went to a dinner at uh, uh, Grubhub over in Carmel Mountain Ranch. And they oh, had Grub. A, oh, is it just Grub? Grubhub like, is the app. Oh, Grubhub. Okay, so just Grub? Oh, yep. Okay, Grub. Okay. Um, but you couldn't use, and I don't use it anyways, but I said we do not allow Apple Pay, or you can't use your phone to pay that way. you got to actually use a credit card. And I thought, wow, that's kind of surprising. So uh, maybe there's some issues with it that people don't want to use their businesses. I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not sure. And I, I, the thing that I look at with Apple, and, and I'm sure – we have listeners, I've been told this before, you guys have been saying this for years on Apple, and it, it's true, but the thing is, when you look at it, and think about the reason we were wrong. We sell out of a company when it hits 16.6 .6 times earnings. Well, Apple has now expanded to 26 and a half mm -hmm. times earnings. So you've gotten this huge increase on the multiple. That has benefited the stock price. Right. That is why we've been against Apple increasing. Now, it's gone from 16.6 .6 to 26 and a half, uh, 26 and a half. Is it going to go to 40 times earnings? Do you really think you're going to get that multiple expansion? Right. I, we thought, again, 16.6 .6 is the long-term average. We always say it can go higher, and it has. Yeah. The other benefit was Apple did continue to grow earnings. But if their earnings, let's say, grow at 2 3%, and you get no multiple expansion, it just stays at 26 and a half times earnings for the next even 5 to 10 years, which I still think is unlikely because that's right. a very expensive multiple. That means if they grow earnings per share 2 to 3% over the next 5 to 10 years, that's your return, yeah. 2 to 3%. And now, if the multiple contracts back down to a historical norm of 16.6, you've lost on the stock. But hey, don't forget that half percent dividend. So <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, well, I'll keep it for the dividend. Yeah, half percent dividend, that, that yeah. won't do very much for you. I, I think it's going to be, and again, it's very possible for it to, and we've saw it before in the past. I mean, it is not... It, 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 it is a it's a business, and people talk about the markets being expensive. I believe Apple accounts for seven and a half percent of the S and P five hundred. That is a strange situation to be in. All the warning signs are out there, and 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 things can stay crazy for a very long time. And we've been not against Apple, but just saying it's too pricey. You don't make money long term buying pricey com com companies. And if it were to fall back down to even twenty times earnings, which would still be high. I mean, the stock would stock would probably fall to what a hundred, I think, is where it said twenty times. I'm like, oh my gosh! I mean, you'd get this snowball effect that that would happen. So, could happen tomorrow, could happen next year, but over the long term, you never make money investing in high-priced companies. They do fall down. And long term, we're talking five, ten, twenty years. 
because what are you going to do when Apple does drop to 100? Or what are you going to do for the next five years if Apple still trades between 140 and 180? You've missed other opportunities that did well. So great company. I got the phone in my pocket, but we just are against overpaying for businesses because it's proven. And we show all these, when people come in for a consultation, we show them how growth is done over the time frame. And it just, it, it there's times it does terrible. Yeah, I mean, I was going to kind of look. It's Let's say Apple goes up to $200 a share. I, I don't have the number in front of me, but what is that, a 40 times earnings multiple? You, you know, like I, I don't know the exact numbers, right. but the problem is it just can't keep going higher based off that multiple. They have to have growth right. to justify growth in the stock price. And I, I I don't see where that comes from. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But as you said, it, it, it could go up. And it could hit its all-time high again. It could go to 190 a share. It could go to 200 a share. But if it hits those levels, the higher and higher it goes, it's like, well, what happens next? Yeah. You, you know, it just can't trade at 30, 40, 50 times earnings for a business that isn't growing earnings. And, and they, they don't have anything new coming out. I mean, the, the iPhone is the iPhone. I think in September they probably have a new release. But it just – you're famous for having the iPhone 8 I think you have – um, I won't get another iPhone unless mine breaks because it, it, Harrison's got the iPhone six still. Six, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shows our, our firm that we are value investors. We really <laughs> did, don't like to overpay for things. I, you know why? One of the reasons I don't get a new phone. Just a little side tangent here is it's so hard when you get a new phone. You got to oh. learn it. You got to make sure all your contacts. Are, I'm like, I don't want to go through that. My phone works fine. <laughs> you know who said that same thing as Warren Buffett? He, he goes, I don't want to buy a new car because you got to buy a new car. You got to read through the owner's manual. Yeah. Everything's all different. It's just like I don't go through the hassle. Same thing with yeah. the phone. It's just like, and I know what you mean because when I when I because my phone broke, it was it was not working. I got a new phone. Like, oh, you got to transfer everything, and that didn't work. And it's just like it takes time. To do all that, which is an opportunity cost of time that I could be, you know, reading a, a, an annual report or talking to a client or something. Or else. laying by the pool even, just not yeah. working. You need to relax sometimes, you know. It's like, yeah. I don't want to take my time off to go to the Apple store, the, the Verizon store, to, to go get my phone <laughs> figured out. It, it is it, it is expensive way to kind of look at it. So, But um, phone number is going to put the phone lines in a couple minutes here. 833-288-0973. You got a question on investing. You got a question on a company that you're looking at buying, selling, or holding. Uh, that's what we're here for, to give you that unbiased, no strings attached, fundamental opinion about what you want to talk about. 833-288-0973. Again, 833-288-0973. Let's about, uh, talk about the consumer. Uh, we see different areas in the economy that appear to be slowing down, but that would definitely not be true for consumer spending on travel and entertainment. Both Visa and MasterCard stated during their earnings uh, last week that this category continued to grow in the first quarter. Also, proving that uh, this fact is domestic airline ticket prices in the U.S. increased to $393.85 at the end of 2022. That was an increase from $327.13 one year earlier. And yes, if you're doing the math, that's about a 20% increase. Uh, also, a recent look of people passing through the Transportation Secretary Administration or the TSA checkpoints on April 27th was up 11% from one year ago to 2.52 million people. The consumer is still spending. They're just spending in different areas. Uh, I guess they feel they have enough TVs and furniture in their homes now. They'd rather be spending on the service. And again, I was watching the Padres game last night. And it's like, it was a packed house. And now they're playing the Dodgers. But wow. I mean, people are going out. They're doing things. I mean, I went to the Padres game earlier. Downtown was packed. There's just, people are spending money. And if, if, Things were terrible. People didn't have money. Things were concerned. That would not be the case. And, and you have to realize what happened during COVID. People could not travel. They could not go to restaurants. So they spent a lot of money on TVs, on computers, on redoing their homes. Well, that has now changed to where now we want it. And we said this would happen, that it's not going to stay that way forever. Now people say, I've got all the TVs. I've got everything I've done. I want to go out and I want to enjoy a restaurant with my friends and my family. I want to travel to Hawaii. I want to do all these different things. So consumer spending has changed. And that's what we talk about. As long as people have a job, they will actually spend money. Now, let's bring up kind of an attached to this where they say, yeah, but Brent, a lot, lot more higher debt now on the credit cards. Well, yeah, that is true. But people, the disposable income 
is much higher than it was back when I compare it to, I think it's 2008 is when I compare mm-hmm. it to. Disposal income is up dramatically since that time frame. So when you look at making things all equal, yeah, the balance is higher, but the percent of disposable income, I, I know we show that as well. I don't know if you don't remember that number, but it's not as high. Yeah, you know, I, I was just thinking while you are talking, I, I think I should probably do a post on that one because we, we used it at our workshop, um, what was that, last month. And it, it's just such a, when you look at it, again, it, it just shows you, and it's so funny, it shows you the, the bad number I'm going to say up right. top, but then we always say a number means nothing at all unless you have something to compare to, and then it shows you the comparison, it's like, oh, that's not that bad. And that's what, like a trillion dollars sounds terrible, but if you compare like a trillion dollars to $20 trillion, well, not that bad. It's all relative, right. You, right. you know, and a lot of times people just point out one number, it's like, but what are you comparing against? Because you know, as I said, I'll repeat it again, number means nothing at all. Unless you have something compared to. And the other one that we look at, too, is back in 2008, the assets that, that everybody had in the United States was, I believe, about $80 trillion. Now that number, I think, is about $165 trillion. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so if the consumer debt was back in, in 2008, $1.2 trillion, and now it's $1.3 trillion, it's a smaller amount of their assets. Yeah, it, it's a higher number. But you got to have things to compare to to say, wait a minute, it's not a bad thing. Consumers can pay that. So uh, th- this is what scares people from investing. And if you're gambling and a trader, maybe you should be afraid. But if you're investing in good businesses that have good earnings and good good um, uh, cash flow and no debt, you're going to be fine. And and right now it's kind of a rocky time. We are, we've talked about it before. We we do believe that this debt ceiling crisis is going to cause some volatility, and there is no doubt in my mind that it's going to go to once again the last minute they have to go to. You you always do that in negotiations because you neither side wants to give anything up, and you won't give something up until you have to. I know the uh, McCarthy came out with a thing for for the uh, Republicans. A plan was rejected. I was not surprised at all, but they're trying to do something. I think they're they're meeting this next Friday, which right. is kind of funny. It's you know again, it goes up to the last minute because now Janet Yellen came out and said that we may run out of funds by January or not January, June first, which is coming up. And I I wanted to bring this number out because it it I talked about this before. I think it was over a twenty year period. I actually even went back further. It is so funny. The debt ceiling has been raised forty five times. Forty five times. In the last 40 years. Because <laughs> I know we used to do one for 20 years, yep. but you went even back even further. So. <laughs> and I, I went back even further one more time. <laughs> this one's even better. Since 1960, it's been 78 times. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's because, you know, when you think about it, I know I think the Democrats right now are talking about doing like a, a, a three-month Maybe extension or extension. something. So that's kind of what happened. Okay, fine. We'll do an extension. We'll do an extension. So you raise it a couple times during a year. So it, why do we even panic about this? No, nobody wants us to default on the debt. We know that we're going to get this fixed. Come June first, yeah, people are going to bicker, go back and forth, right. and it might go up until May thirty first at eleven fifty p.m. But I am. I can't guarantee it, but I am very confident. Based off our history, that, that will come times, to rest. Right, it's, it's been raised. Um, and the, the thing, too, and I did also hear that, well, there's some other things the government can do to extend that to June 1st. There's so many different things they can do. It, it's almost, I, I almost wish the <laughs> the media would put the White House on blackout. We're not going to talk about it any longer because all it is is a back and forth, back and forth. But you said since 1960, which is now, what, over 60 years, <laughs> You've raised it 74, 78. 78 times. It'll be raised 79 times. Yep. They, they're just not going to do that. They're not going to default on the debt. Um, we've talked about, you know, yeah, going to be extended. But it's just, I, I know it's going to be a problem. Now, I could be wrong on that. I mean, it was a problem back in 2012. But we'll see what happens this time. But it, it, it will be will be raised, they, and it could be extended because they could do other short-term things. And they have so many different little tools they don't bring out. But it's like it's it's almost where they want to be, like, in, in the, the front of the scene, you know? Well, I think it's, it's politics. It's right. They want to go back to their base and say, I fought for this. We didn't want the country to fold, so we caved on this, this, and this. Right. But we fought. We stood, we stood hard on this. Right. And it, that way they have something— if they were to, if one of the sides were to cave right now, I think the base of either party would be like, 
what? What are they? Th-? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. Because like, if somebody gives in, like, why'd you give in? That was because somebody, both sides, will give in as they do in, in the past. In the meantime, it's going to come out in the morning on the the news. The Dow is going to fall. This is going to happen next day. It's going to go up. <laughs> Just stop looking on a daily basis and find a great company that's on sale. Collect those dividends, and and by the end of the year. Um, I'm, I'm saying in our companies, I can't give the percentage return, but by the end of the year, I think it's going to have a very good year for us because we don't hold the high flyers, but we'll get through this debt ceiling. Well, the interest rates, we believe, will stop being raised. Uh, yep. after. So it's going to be a great year for us in our portfolio uh, after, I think, uh, probably the second half of the year yeah. or during the second half. Yeah, of the year. We, we believe it'll be a great year barring any anything that, <laughs> yeah. that could happen. I mean, you never know if there's a COVID type situation, but I mean, right. again, even co- it, it it comes down <laughs> to owning businesses and good quality businesses. And you could be wrong for six months. You could be wrong for a year. You could be wrong for a year and a half at times. Yeah. But you own businesses, and the businesses are still working on generating cash flow, generating earnings, and building a good business plan. Not even over the next year or two years. Many times they're looking five, ten years down right. the road. Right. And when we talk about our portfolio, it is different than the S and P five hundred. Because I, I mentioned earlier that uh, Apple's about seven and a half percent or seven point two percent. The S and P. I think you said when you added Microsoft, what was that number? That just those two companies. Yeah, I, I think I'll do a post on it this week okay. as well. So I'll remember not to talk about it on the radio show again next week. <laughs> but it is uh, about combined. If you take Apple and Microsoft, it's about fourteen percent, close to fourteen percent of the entire S and P five hundred. So that means two companies account for fourteen percent, and then. 498 companies account for 86 percent right on the qqq on the nasdaq it's even worse i believe apple and microsoft together account for about 25 percent of the entire qqq right and and actually let's also too because when we do that it's also in that newsletter that we talk about so Mm -hmm. it's in the newsletter and actually in this newsletter coming up uh and it's a free newsletter you can get it on our website go to smartinvesting2000.com that's smartinvesting2000.com. It's right in the middle of our page. It says newsletter. Click on that. You can sign up. I mean, other things for this week you'll see in the newsletter is mortgage loans, uh, office values. Uh, we do discuss market volatility, market predictions, uh, some changes on uni- union leadership. So it really helps you become a smarter investor to keep you on track. And it's not a long newsletter. It doesn't take you two hours to read. Uh, we try to make it so it's concise. And within about five minutes, you can get some great information. And and maybe you don't care about mortgage loans. Well, you don't read that section. Read the, read the other sections. So try it out. Again, go to our website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. All right. All lines are open, 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. And, you know, I was just thinking, the other reason that newsletter is so great Mm-hmm. is because that's what we look at on a weekly basis. A lot of what we show you is kind of what helps also drive our investment thinking right. when we're looking at different businesses and so forth, looking at the, the stock market as a whole, the economy. What we send out is kind of our thoughts on what we've analyzed during the week. Right. So it, it, there's a, I think there's a lot of value to it. And it used to be just for clients, and we thought, well, let's help out other people. Let's send it to other people. And, and, and also we have gotten clients from it because when they see we get that information – then how we utilize that information. So they read the newsletter, they become clients because they want us to utilize it. But we opened it up years ago saying, well, let's show everybody this because it's some great information to help other investors as well. So again, website, smartinvesting2000.com. Free newsletter goes out Fridays at uh, five o'clock, I think mm-hmm. is when it goes out. All right, uh, I, I'm so excited to talk to Harrison this morning because he's, he's got a topic that's always been a hot button for me and that is 401k loans. Uh, good morning, Harrison. How are you doing this morning? Good morning, guys. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good, good. This is something that I, I'm going to give you the microphone here and let you talk because it's something that I know people get confused on. So let's get them straight on this, talking about 401k loans. So 401k loans, uh, these are fairly common, so I wanted to touch on some things. Um, some 401k plans allow participants to borrow from them. Uh, you can borrow up to 50% of the account, up to a maximum of $50,000. Once you borrow, you have to repay that loan within five years through payroll contributions. However, if you separate from your job, the full balance becomes due, and if you can't pay it, it will be taxable, and you could have penalties on it. Um, during that five-year term, you have to make what's called substantial, substantially equal payments that include principal and interest. 
You can pay it back sooner if you want, but you have to begin making payments at least quarterly. Uh, the interest rate is typically 1% plus the prime rate, which is sits right now at eight and a quarter percent. So if someone took a 401k loan right now, they might have an interest rate around nine and a quarter percent. And the point I wanted to make is this. Um, this is called a 401k loan and it has an interest rate, but it isn't really a loan. What it is, is a withdrawal that you have to pay back to yourself plus interest. So for example, if you take out a line of credit like a HELOC against your house, you aren't withdrawing from your house, you're getting money from a bank while using your house as collateral. Then you pay the bank back plus interest. If during that time your house goes up in value, you keep all of that appreciation even though there is a line of credit against it. With the 401k loan, you are withdrawing from your own assets. So while your money is withdrawn, you are missing out on growth in your account. The natural rebuttal to this is that, well, at least with a 401k loan, you are paying interest to yourself, which is true. Any interest on your 401k loan repayment goes into your own account. But what's really happening here? Instead of your 401k earning its own investment returns, the return is coming from your contributions. In other words, the outstanding loan balance has an investment return of 0%. And not only that, but when you are repaying the loan, the payment is made with after-tax dollars, which means you have to earn income, pay tax on that income, and then use the net to pay back the loan. Then when you withdraw the funds in retirement, you pay tax on that again. So you are getting double taxed on the interest component of the loan. So people like 401k loans because they think they're borrowing from their themselves, but really, you know, they're they're kind of reducing what their retirement income would be, and they're causing themselves to pay more in taxes. And Harrison, this seems to be, and I don't know how to describe this, but there's misinformation in the financial world that people hear and they go with, and it doesn't come from professionals. It's just it's like that they talk about that. You hear it all the time. The thing is, well, it makes a lot of sense to pay yourself back, and you just told them why that's not a good idea. But it's just amazing to me how these things get started and they continue on and on because I have never said it's a great idea to borrow against your 401k for all the reasons you just pointed out, but it's still done many times. Yeah, and I would say, you know, a 401k loan might be better than a credit card with a 30% interest rate, <laughs> oh, <yeah>. but <laughs> pretty, pretty, much, pretty much any other, if I could get financing any other way, that's what I would look at. Because again, with a 401k loan, it's not really a loan. You're just withdrawing from your own account. So, um, I mean, the whole benefit of borrowing money is you can use other people's money to, to do whatever you're doing. Hopefully invest in something and then, you know, make more money. Um, so I think a lot of people get confused, you know, what a 401k loan is and how beneficial it actually is, especially think, with the tax component, yeah. because a lot of people don't get that. You're, you're, you're causing yourself to pay double taxes on whatever you're borrowing. And I think the other way people should look at it is, you know, as you said, it's about a five-year term loan, is the opportunity cost of your earnings. I'm just going to make it very easy. If you take out $50,000, obviously that $50,000 is no longer working and, and growing for you. Let's say over that five-year period, your investments grew at, let's say, 9%. Well, you basically just cost yourself a 9% rate over that five-year period. And in mm -hmm. many cases, as you added, there's the, the tax component as well. So mm -hmm. your net cost to yourself could almost be 10%. You would have been far better off going out and maybe getting a HELOC, which if you use it for home improvement or something, is tax deductible over that period. <laughs> so you, you have to, as you said, look at all the components for the taxation. And people always, always discount the impact of opportunity cost. And, yeah. and, and you mentioned it. It does make sense if you have like, you know, credit card loans or credit cards with a, and I think they rate still 18%. That is true on the financial side, but what I have seen in my 40 plus years of doing this, what people will do is they will borrow against the 401k, do this terrible financial deal, we'll call it, use that to pay off their credit card, you know, credit cards. And then two years later, you look, they still got the 401k loan and those credit card balances are back up again. <laughs> you know, yeah. So yeah. sometimes you need yeah. that pain. You need to be whipped a little bit to say, no, that was stupid to have those high credit card balances there. I'm going to pay that 18%, get those paid off. I am not going to go against my 401k loan because I've seen people down the road where they've got 
that loan. They've got loans against their 401k. And it's a terrible situation. But you've got to have financial discipline. And you never touch that 401k. I, I, I've been investing for over 40 years. I have never taken out from my retirement account. Well, no, I am wrong on that. I think I did take it out. I had to borrow against it one time for something. I forget what it was, but I paid it back in 30 days uh, because you get the 60 day rollover and I forget what it was for. And that's, that's, I, I mean, that's a, a similar type of thing, indirect rollover where you can take it out and put it back, but that's, you know, 60 days maximum as opposed to five years, five years. And so, yeah. um, yeah. And, and I hated doing it. I remember like, gosh, I hate doing that. I hate yeah. doing that. But, <laughs> but it, it, it didn't make sense for that short time frame there. But you should, it's the last resort you want to go to. And I, I get so disappointed when clients call in, well, I want to borrow against my 401k to buy a home. And it's like, no, keep your 401k. I mean, if you can't afford the home, don't worry about it, especially the prices homes are now. You know, it, it's just the financial discipline is, is terrible. And there's things out here that people talk about. And it's just like, where do these myths come from? When it's sold, it's such a good idea. Like, I've talked to so many people, like, oh, I, I, I used my 401k to buy a home, and I, I'm, like, so proud of that decision. And it's like, I'm like, oh, like, good for you. Like, I, I, I don't know what to say, because it, it's not the right financial choice. Like, if you actually look at the numbers, like, and I always tell people, if you want something and you do it, it doesn't necessarily right. always mean it's a bad thing, but it, don't try and sell me it's a good financial decision because <laughs> you know I you know we're not all, we're human beings we're still going to spend money we're still going to do things if we were financially just doing the right thing all the time I remember we, our estate planning attorney we work with he's like well then we'd just live under the highway you know and, <laughs> and we work and we wouldn't have rent we wouldn't have a car and that's how it would be we have wants we have desires but you know it's just like it, it's not the best financial decision so don't try and sell me on that it's something that you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. And the other piece that you can add on to that with the house, I mean, as opposed to withdrawing from a 401k loan, I would say just make a smaller down payment and get more of a mortgage because the mortgage interest rate is going to be deductible where the interest that you're paying to your 401k isn't really interest because you're paying it back to yourself. So that is not deductible. And from a cash flow perspective, since that loan that you have to take needs to be paid back in five years, the payment on that cash flow wise is going to be a lot higher than if you had rolled that into uh, a mortgage that's amortized over 30 years. And Harrison, here's one thing I'll, I'll let you give the, the punchline here, but you work for an employer, you've got that uh, 401k loan, you get an offer from another company for a 20% pay raise. So you're going to leave that company because you want to get that pay raise. Why don't I explain to people what happens with that loan, what has to be done with that 401k? You've got to come up with the cash to pay it back, or it's all taxable federal and state side. And if you're under 59 and a half, then it's also um, you have a state and federal penalty on it. So 10% federal penalty, California charges a two and a half percent penalty. And um, and then your your federal taxes, you know, it could be 22, 24, 32 percent. State taxes could be 9.3 percent. So you're looking at you know, 50% close to uh, tax and penalties if you can't get that money back in there. And I use a positive say, uh, example that you would leave for another job, but even if you get laid off, it's the same situation. Yep, yep. Any type of separation, retirement, you get fired, you get laid off, um, you, you accept another job, any type of separation uh, qualifies for that. Yeah, so it's just such a, a major thing. I mean, it should be your absolute last resort. And and even then, I I would say barring from friends and family, <laughs> I'd say that because <laughs> it's just a terrible thing to do that you can really get yourself in a financial bind. And I, I will tell you, we have no bias in this because, I mean, we do manage 401ks for companies, yeah. but we have clients that have 401ks that we can't manage. And I would never recommend that they take money from right. that 401k to do it either. I mean, it's just something mm -hmm. that is... You know, again, my unbiased opinion here truly does not impact us at all for our clients. I would never recommend it. <laughs> and we, when we do the 401ks for the companies, we do recommend for the employer not to allow the loans. And, it, it, and I know, like, oh, that sounds terrible. But, no, it is the, the right thing to do. This is supposed to be money for your retirement, not to be using as a financial tool to buy a home or pay off credit cards or anything else. It should be your retirement. And, that, and I, we've seen people, and this is terrible. I have a client right now. She's 70, and she's in a financial bind. She doesn't have a lot of money, and she's got to start taking more than what we can pay on a monthly income. And I'm just thinking probably in two years she's going to have nothing left. 
because of poor financial decisions over her lifetime. And, and it's terrible to see. We, I've seen it before. People in their 70s where they run out of money. And they always say, well, well what am I going to do? And I go, uh, I don't know. I mean, this is why you don't do crazy things with your 401k or your retirement and why you build a good retirement. So, okay, I'll get off the soapbox there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Harrison, thank you very much. Uh, great information. And I, and I hope that people uh, got something out of it. Uh, thank you very much. And we will see you. We'll see you at the game tomorrow. Yes. 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 We'll see you at the game tomorrow. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, guys. See ya. Again, as uh, Harrison Johnson, he is our financial planner. He is a CFP. He's on a salary, so he doesn't sell you life insurance or annuities or any products. His job is to be a fee-based financial planner, to do a financial plan for a fee for you, and to talk about things like he just talked about in the 401k to give you good guidance so that throughout your financial life, you don't make poor decisions that you regret 20, 30 years down the road. So if you want a free consultation with Harrison, give him a call at the office, 858 858- Five four six four three zero six. That's eight five eight five four six four three zero six. Or you can reach them through the website uh, by email. That website is smartinvesting two thousand dot com. That again is smartinvesting two thousand dot com. All right, all phone lines are open eight three three two eight eight zero nine seven three. That's eight three three two eight eight. 0973. We do have an email question here, which uh, I know we have more people now on the podcast and so forth. If you do want to have a question answered, you don't want to come on air uh, or you listen to the podcast, uh, you can send us an email again at the website smartinvesting2000.com, smartinvesting2000.com, and we can answer the question for you on air. This comes from uh, Zach. He says, I was wondering if you guys could analyze Lowe's, uh, symbol L O W if you get a chance one of these Saturdays. I've held it for a while and the three year return has been excellent, but I am worried about their long-term debt as the debt to equity seems to be a red flag. I love the store and the business model, but as you two often say about Apple, just because you love the business doesn't mean you love the stock. Keep up the great work, thanks, and go Padres. All right, so let's look at the Lowe's uh, companies and that is the the, uh, home retailer. Uh, home Improvement Leap Retailer, symbol L-O-W. Uh, they are in the home improvement retail industry. Not much float on the, on the stock, 1.4, 77.5% institutional owned. Uh, we do see that the P-E ratio is on the higher side. It's a 20.2 above the industry at 18.5. They na- have no price to book value or no price to tangible book value, either one. And, and Zach did mention about the high debt. So I think while you're looking at something, Chase, I'm going to actually look at their debt levels on the balance sheet. Uh, price of cash flow, 15.1 versus 18.2. Uh, peg ratio, very good, 1.8 versus 11.8. Now, their earnings over the last year fell uh, by 17.6%. The industry is down 0.8%. I'm surprised by that. I'm not sure why they fell. So if you own the company, look at buying it, you want to understand why their earnings fell almost 18% over the past year. Uh, Their sales are only up 1.6%. The whole industry only up 1.9%. The five-year estimated growth on Lowe's is 7.6%, about twice the industry at 3.8%. Now, they do pay a 2% dividend, only use 38.7% of their earnings to pay that dividend out. They paid that dividend for 10 consecutive years. We do see on the balance sheet, you've got a current ratio of 1.1 versus 1.3. That's okay. But no debt to equity because there's no equity. Uh, and I'm going to look again at that balance sheet when Chase is looking at the numbers going forward. <clears throat> they do have a net profit margin of 6.6 versus 8.4. Return on equity, well, negative 45. There's no equity there. Return on invested capital is 31.9 versus 30.5. So I'm, I, I always like Lowe's, and I'm kind of surprised on these numbers. So I'm kind of curious what you have going forward here, Chase. Yeah, it, it is kind of strange. Got a couple of thoughts, but I'll go through the numbers first. So current price here for Lowe's is two hundred five dollars and eighty one cents. The fifty two week high is two hundred twenty three dollars and thirty one cents, and the low is one hundred seventy dollars and twelve cents. Now, if we go out to January two thousand twenty five, they do report on a fiscal basis. The estimated earnings per share is fifteen dollars and six cents. Actually, does give us a target sell price of about two hundred fifty dollars a share. Trades at around uh, forward PE of uh, about 13.7 times future earnings. So I think it would be pretty close to our hold category. I'm not right. overly excited about the valuation, but also I wouldn't call it overly expensive. But the weird thing that I, I see here is, and I've 
recognized this over the years. They've bought back a ton of stock. I noticed their buyback yields about 11.5%. So they've used a lot of money to do that. And the reason that's important is I see earnings growth year over year is about 9.6%, but sales growth is just 2%. So mm-hmm. it's almost like kind of what we talked about with Apple earlier. It's like, is this company really growing or are they just kind of, they're not manipulating. We like stock buybacks, right? but they're almost elevating how well the business is doing because earnings aren't really growing, potentially just earnings per share are growing from stock buybacks. And uh, you, had, you said the comment too, was that the, the comment? You that were? was the comment. Okay, yeah, because looking at the, 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 the company here, I, I do see, and now that you mentioned about the cash, they don't have a lot of cash left. I mean, I'm going back, this sheet goes back to October 2020, uh, back then, they had eight point two million dollars and two billion eight point two billion dollars in cash. Uh, as of January twenty third, their fiscal year reporter, uh, only one point three billion in cash. So they have used a lot for those stock buybacks. Which, what I'm thinking, that's how they've done financial management to get those earnings higher. What's going to happen for the next year or two when they don't have that cash to buy that back? I did want to look at the debt. That's what I said I would do on the balance sheet here. Uh, the debt is currently $36.4 billion. Now, I can see that continue has continued to grow going back to October 2020. Uh, it was $25 billion. So that's an increase of about $13 billion, almost a 50% increase. They have no equity. Uh, they have a negative equity of $14.2 billion negative equity, which means your liabilities exceed your assets. And that has continually gotten worse. It first started back in June 21. They had negative equity of $175 million. And each quarter, it continued to build consecutively up to the $14.2 billion. Back in 2020, it was a positive $4 billion. So I think it's a great company. I, I go to Lowe's. I, it's close to my house. I like going in there to shop. But look at these numbers, which I've not looked at in a while. I'm seeing a, a bad direction here. Uh, and I will say, I remember looking at Home Depot a few years ago, and I haven't looked at Home Depot stock at either in quite a while, but I, and I just kind of know from, from going to the stores is, you know, you can rent trucks, you can rent equipment, right. and, and you have to understand that they, they carry those assets differently on the balance sheet, and they may finance different things as well there. So the reason I point that out is the financing and the, the rental business potentially could have an impact on the balance sheet. Right. So. It scares me looking at those numbers, right. but I'm just trying to point Zach and our other listeners in a direction of there could be a potential reason for that, but you have to understand that reason because looking at these numbers, I would not go anywhere near Lowe's. A company that has negative equity, just that's scary. And you bring up a good point about the inventory of having the trucks that, that they rent and so forth. And, and we look at that when you have like a, a dealership or a car company where they actually carry that inventory, they had the loans on it. The only difference I see here when I go to, you know, uh, over in Carmel and Ranch to the Home Depot, I see two trucks sitting out there. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how many, you know, locations they have. And I don't think. But they have other things too. Like I remember you can rent a carpet cleaner and there's other things that yeah, you But it'd can... be so small, I think, on a percentage wise. But it depends how much they do in rentals. If you yeah. have, it's not like they're just doing one. Otherwise they wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. Know? Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and. And, and that's just one example. They might do chainsaws. They might, they might do a bunch of different things that you can rent. Right. I don't know. I, 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 I'm not in the, the, the business of needing a chainsaw at this moment. <laughs> but I'm just I got, using I got that as an example. If you want one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it but it's it's things that and again we're, these are the discussions we have with companies that we we, we talk about because we look at things we dissect them because we don't have the answers. But we're saying this could be a situation. The same thing with Lowe's. And if you own Lowe's stock or looking at buying it, you want to answer these questions because. It could be, a, as Chase said, maybe maybe that's no problem with the debt because of that. Or maybe it's not that much at all because, uh, again, it is a huge company. But you want the answer to that question because it could be where this company, what was the stock price you said at currently? Uh, current Two, price here is 205.81. 205.81, yeah. So, I mean, it, it could drop down to, you know, 150, 160 because if they can't keep those earnings going because how – now. If, if they start borrowing to buy stock, that's that that's a a, a no no. Yeah. I mean, I you know unless your stock is on sale and your company's trading at five six times earnings, 
you should never borrow money to buy back your own stock. That 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 I believe is the beginning of the end for many companies. So, and as I said, I mean, you bought back eleven percent of your stock. That's what that buyback yield is essentially based off the market cap of the company. I mean, that that's a very substantial amount. If they don't keep buying back stock or they slow down that, or again, that stock price goes up, that buyback yield drops, that's going to drop earnings per share as well, growth. So that that's a problem. Where's that earnings growth going to come from? And as I said, the analysts anticipate about a 10% year-over-year growth. They could have other drivers on that. Obviously, the, right. the stock buyback is not the only catalyst potentially for earnings growth. So I'm just pointing that out. It's very strange that sales growth is very limited and earnings growth is, is substantially higher than that. Right. And I did take a quick peek at the cash flow. Uh, nothing really major there. I mean, the cash flow for the first quarter was uh, four hundred fifty-one million dollars. Uh, I went back to uh, that's January twenty-three, January twenty twenty-two. It was nine hundred thirty-four million dollars, so it dropped from there. Uh, January twenty-one, a different situation. That was kind of during COVID. It was a negative four thirty-six. And uh, I want to kind of go back to our conversation earlier in the show about Apple. Yeah, remember how I said it was about a three percent buyback? Right. Lowe's did eleven and a half percent, so that that's a big buyback. <laughs> that's a, you know? That is a big buyback. Uh, but they didn't get the same credit when they announced their buyback. No, no, <laughs> because it's a dollar amount. And, and here's the other thing too with buybacks. Uh, when did they announce? Do you know when Lowe's? No, announced I don't know buyback? when they announced it. This right. is just their stock buyback activity right. over the past. Because that's an important to. And one thing that people also need to know. When they announce the buyback, they are not locked into doing that. They can say, ah, no, what wasn't worthwhile doing. So they say they'll do it. Most of the time they will. But I'm also wondering, too, it's like if Lowe's did that, announce that, we'll say six months ago, I don't see where they're going to get the cash to do that. So they may not end up doing that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. Or they could have completed the stock buyback last year, used that cash. Now they don't have a stock buyback program going forward because they utilize that capital. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of questions here. Um, I wish the numbers looked a lot simpler, a lot easier, a lot cleaner. But, I, I mean, and even the valuation is not that attractive yeah. for me to be like, oh, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Right. I, I'm, I, there's a lot of question marks for a valuation that is decent. And, and it's so hard because I've always liked this company. And this is where the emotional side comes. Oh, I like this company. And so but it's like, gosh, I, a lot of questions on these numbers, and, and I, I don't see this doing well going forward. I, I was looking at the balance sheet when you, you came up with the target price going forward, uh, but I think I heard you say like only 20% growth or something on it. Uh, it's 250 is the target sell price. 250, okay. And, and, and I do see that the earnings estimates have fallen. for They were, what, a down uh, high of 15, 18. I don't know what you came up with, but here I show 14, 73. So the earnings estimates going forward. Uh, for February 2025 are falling. So um, I, 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 they did very well. We talked about this early in the show. This was one of the things that did very well during COVID. When people couldn't get out, they could go to the Home Depot or Lowe's, get you know decking, all these other things. Well, now they're not going there as much because they're going to Hawaii. They're going to France. They're going to different places. They're traveling. So uh, I, I, I just would be a little bit concerned on a Home Depot or a Lowe's. Great businesses but Lowe's, I'm I'm very disappointed in the numbers I'm seeing. Who's going to France? That was a random. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Just like uh, we're going to Spain, but yeah. I don't, you know, why did I say Spain? Why did I say France? I don't know. I just popped in my head. You know, no. maybe but I, I I mean, you're so right. Those again, talked about this before. Is if you own this stock, where is the growth going to come from? Yeah. I mean, we look at our companies. We want them to continue to grow, and I I don't see where potential growth comes from from Lowe's. They got big benefits from COVID. Uh, I do think the home improvement space kind of got dinged over the last couple of years. I think there's going to be some demand that does come back, but I don't know if it's going to be enough to drive that much improvement at Lowe's. Right, right. So, And, and these are the things that we, we talk about when we tell people before you invest in any company, it's 10, 15, 20 hours of research. I mean, that's why we only buy like three or four companies a year because it takes a lot of time to do it right. Yeah. So. Well, that's a closing bell. Gosh, it went by quick today. Thank you for listening to Smart Investing Show. It is for informational purposes only. It should not be used as investment advice. If you'd like to discuss in more detail your investment needs, have other investment questions, feel free to call myself Brent Wilsey or Chase Wilsey at 858-546-4306. That's 858-546-4306. And you can also send us an email by visiting our website at Smart investing2000.com that's smart investing2000.com uh, a lot of great information there on the newsletter sign up for the newsletter while you're there thanks for listening we'll be back next week right here on the smart investing show and hope to see you tomorrow at the padre stadium as i throw out the first pitch
there I did all that And may I say 